Yves Blau is an adjunct professor of the history and theory of urban form and design, and the director of research at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where she also directs the center, the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. She has been a visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, a fellow at the International Center of Cultural Studies in Vienna, the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, and the Paul Getty Trust. Professor Blau is the co-director of the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative. This cross-Harvard initiative brings together scholars to foster innovative, innovative approaches to the study of cities and urbanization that bring together scholarship, design, and media around the study of urban environments. In 2018, she co-curated Urban Intermedia, City Archive Narrative, an exhibition presenting the new visual and digital methods for acquiring and producing knowledge about cities developed in phase one of the initiative shown in Berlin, Istanbul, Mumbai, as well as Boston. Professor Blau's research engages various issues in urban and architectural history, theory, and the productive intersection between urban spatial form and media. The underlying concern is with the complex dynamics of urban transformation in the context of rapidly changing socio-political, environmental, and technological conditions. In her published work, she has developed innovative critical methodologies for understanding the dynamics and processes by which urban spatial practices operate and change. She has written extensively on modern architecture and urbanism and, and has curated numerous exhibits. Some of her extensive work includes books on Baku, Oil and Urbanism, published in 2018, The Architecture of Red, Vienna, 1919 to 1934, Project Zagreb, Transition as Condition, Strategy, Practice, published in 2007, Urban Form, City Building in post fordist Society in 2003, Shaping the Great City, Modern Architecture in Central Europe from 1890 to 1937, published in 2000, Architecture and Cubism, published in 1997. She has also edited two special journal issues of the Harvard Design Magazine, volume 37, on urbanism's core and architectural history, 1999-2000, a special, issue, a special issue of JSAH in 1999. Um, Professor Blau has been awarded the Victor Adler State Prize by the Republic of Austria in 2015 for her contributions to the history of social movements and the innovative methods of her scholarship. In 2018, she received the DAM Architectural Book Award from the German Architecture Museum and Frankfurt Book Fair in 2019. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. President of the Board of Directors of the American Friends of the Canadian Center for Architecture, former Vice President of the International Scholarly Advisory Board of the International Research Center for Cultural Studies in Vienna. And she serves on the advisory board of Columbia Themes in Philosophy, Social Criticism and the Arts, Columbia University Press, and the editorial board of Journal of Planning History. Please join me in welcoming Professor Eve Blau. Thank you very much, Andres. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I appreciate the fact that people have come during a very busy week uh, of exams and so forth. So um, anyhow, I will start and I look forward to discussion and questions and so forth. Um, uh, at the end. So um, my topic, as you saw, what do I do here? So um, yeah, my topic is uh, controlled experiment. Um, of the production of socialist space. Um, um, and uh, so what I'm gonna do is look at the production of social space as part of an ongoing experiment that was carried out more or less on the ground uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century in the middle decades also of state socialism. And Soviet urbanization itself, as I'm sure you know, was an ongoing experiment. Um, and it was conceived as an ongoing experiment. And 
That experiment was directed towards developing and shaping a new kind of urban formation outside of uh, the capitalist system. I uh, won't go into that because I'm sure most of you know about it and I don't have time. Um, so in the talk, what I'm going to do is focus on the, the evolution of one particular aspect, which is a very important one actually in socialist planning, which is the micro ran, the micro ran or the micro district as an urban formation that had very specific spatial and social and economic uh, attributes and parameters. Um, and that became really the new unit of uh, settlement in socialist planning in the post-war period, and lasted more or less through uh, the 1980s. So I'm gonna start, however, with the origins of the microran as a social e uh, ecological urban form, um, which, uh, and the conceptual programmatic and foundational uh, origins of the concept itself. So I'm gonna suggest that it originated in England around 1900. It was developed further in Germany in the 1920s. Uh, and in the 1950s, it became the official unit of socialist planning, as I said, in Soviet Russia, uh, but also uh, across the USR and its satellites in Eastern Europe, in Eurasia, parts of Central Asia and so on. So um, both the concept and form changed over time in, and in different contexts. And that history, I think, is really important for understanding how uh, and, uh, uh, and why micro-rams were shaped in the way they were. So I'm going to begin with uh, what I see as the place uh, intellectual and social of uh, the set of concerns that led to the evolution of the micro -ram as the urban unit of socialist design practice. And uh, that site was in uh, the gardens in Garden City Fury, or at least that's what I maintain. And <clears throat> which, and in fact, in one of the most innovative and important urban architectural uh, theories um, in early uh, in the 20th century garden city planning. And that uh, concept um, was uh, Raymond Unwin's super block, which was a cornerstone of his planning theory and practice. Uh, and there's Raymond Unwin on the left. Um, a word about him. His practice was focused on the garden city and the garden suburb and garden suburb planning. He designed Letchworth Garden City, you see an image of it here, uh, which was the first one built in England and he later moved away from the garden city to the garden suburb, uh, which is a different kind of urban formation. Now, one of uh, Unwin's major concerns in garden city design was with solar orientation, the insulation uh, of buildings, not insulation, but insulation. Um, and he dealt with that topic at length in his book, Town Planning uh, in Practice of 1909. And here are a couple of uh, solar diagrams from the book. The first one uh, on the left shows sunrise and sunset in London uh, compared to other cities. And on the right is the relative uh, elevation and approximate path of the sun in London at different times of the year. So he was examining these things very carefully and it was this concern that led him to the evolution of the superblock, which is at the heart of uh, uh, micro, micro ray on, uh, planet. So for Unwin, solar orientation, and this is what's particularly interesting about it in this context, was not only an important ecological and health consideration in housing design, uh, of bringing light uh, into urban space, but it was an important economic and social practice uh, and in a principle, sorry, and a, an ethical question actually of social equity. And so the problem that he struggled with in his practice and also in his theoretical writing was how to integrate solar orientation 
into urban planning, which means actually into capitalist space. And he figured out how to do that with the super block. So I want to look at that first. Now, in his famous diagram, which you probably know, uh, of the super block, which is called Nothing Gained by Overcrowding, he made the argument that uh, for the economic advantages of the super block as a planning concept. And his argument in this was that the super block allowed for major savings on infrastructure, construction costs, because there were fewer streets. And it meant that you could build at <clears throat> lower density <clears throat> within the block. So you see here the super block on the right, and then what was called the bylaw street, I'll explain in a minute uh, on the left. So this meant that you could lower density inside the block and you could increase open space and greenery and sunlight and so on, since land costs were offset by savings on street construction uh, costs. So that's his argument here. And the, the bylaw street was this, the, the street or organization of urban space that was part of the, the 1875 uh, Public Health Act that legislated that all residential buildings needed to face onto streets. And so uh, Unwin and various other people um, saw this as a, a kind of mechanical slum, as they put it. So um, in the Garden City, uh, Unwin began to experiment with ways of freeing up the building line from the street line, um, uh, which the superblock made possible. And you could only do this in the countryside. Uh, you couldn't do it in the city because of the bylaw streets. So on the uh, left is an image um, of a plan from Letchworth uh, where he used the cul-de-sac, the dead end or the interior street, you can see that on the left to detach buildings <clears throat> from the street line. And here is a diagrammatic view of that of cul-de-sacs compared to uh, the bylaw street. And here's another example, um, which is a project. So this is this is this is interesting actually because this is Letchworth. So you can see these cul-de-sacs, but what is really interesting is the plan that shows you all of these little uh, cul-de-sacs that uh, break away from the street and that go inside the block. Do you know that the block, of course, in, in, in uh, capitalist planning, um, there's a clear separation between public and private space. And that infrastructure uh, is the public space provided by um, government, city, municipality, and the, the block itself and the inside of the block are given over to uh, for private development, um, usually by uh, a speculative development. So here's another example um, of this kind of thing, of an urgent urban project outside the city of York. And here you could see on the right that the buildings are almost totally disengaged from the tree, uh, from the street line. And Unwin theorized this actually as a new kind of planning that merged two distinct planning systems. One of them was town planning, which was the arrangement of streets, and the other one was site planning. This is no miracle here, uh, which is the arrangement of buildings and landscape within the block. And he argued, though, that uh, together, these two kinds of planning shape the urban form of the garden city and the garden suburb. So his main argument, though, was that the same principles could be applied to planning in the city, not just the garden, uh, the garden city or the garden suburb. And that's the argument of this diagram uh, here on the right. So what he argued here is that the building, once the building is disengaged from the street, it can be oriented for maximum uh, insulation. So he recommended this diagram here on the right, which is the one that was uh, incredibly influential and through which uh, sort of in which traveled towards uh, the micro rayon. So it's this strict alignment on a north south uh, axis for east west exposure. And this rectilinear, uh, he, he um, proposed for the first time this kind of rectilinear geometry and he criticized 
uh, his own Garden City um, sort of winding streets. Now, this diagram had enormous influence in Europe or on European planning in the 1920s. Um, and, uh, but the most important aspect of Unwin's superblock site planning, actually, before we turn to what was going on in Germany, and the key to its enthusiastic reception and later life in socialist planning was that for Unwin, solar equity, um, the democratization of access to sunlight was part of a larger social and political project to combat the spatialization of class in the city. And this connection is not always made um, in discussions of Unwin. So he argued that the super block had the potential to develop into a new kind of urban social space. So we'll look at that. So for Unwin, <coughs> sorry, the super block as an urban spatial form contained an important political argument. And that was that you could improve the quality of urban life <coughs> sorry, by giving everyone more space and access to greenery and sunlight without using any more land. And more than that though, you could create a new kind of communal space in the city, a kind of space that had disappeared from the modern capitalist city and you could do that by inserting social program inside the block. And so as such, the block had the capacity to grow into a more complex uh, social and physical unit. And he saw this as uh, a possible idea for combating um, the spatialization of class in the modern city. So um, it had its most immediate influence um, in Germany in the 1920s. And bless you. And Unwin's arguments <laughs> and diagrams resonated particularly with um, social democratic city building officials in Germany. And um, this is one of them, a very important one, Ernst Mai, uh, who had studied with Unwin in England. And Mai and others were dealing with this massive housing crisis in the 1920s in Europe after World War I. Um, Mai was the city architect and planner of the city of Frankfurt. Um, and here he is. And uh, here is the program. It was called the New Frankfurt. And you can see in the image on the left, uh, there were the satellite towns. That was the idea of the New Frankfurt. It was built. Uh, around the old Frankfurt. Um, and uh, he immediately um, understood the potential of super block planning for producing this uh, new, more equitable and healthy social uh, and, in phys and physical urban environment in the new Frankfurt. Um, the new Frankfurt was you know, involved more than housing. It involved a whole social uh, program as well as um, we'll see in a minute in uh, construction. So um, in Frankfurt, he conducted uh, rigorous research into uh, social orient, uh, sorry, solar or social, but also solar orientation studies. Here are some examples. And the, they discovered that buildings should be aligned to uh, 22 and a half degrees from true north south. And he also analyzed them. That's what this diagram is here on the right. Uh, their solar orientation in relationship to domestic space uh, and to activities. You know, the living rooms and the kitchen should face west, get afternoon sun, bedrooms face east. Uh, in, so you get the morning sun and, and get up. So um, best housing, which was um, one of the components of Frankfurt, uh, of the new Frankfurt, was really a, a sort of extreme uh, rationalization of Unwin's super block site planning model um, into a new urban formation that was um, developed in Germany at the time and in, in Frankfurt, but also in Berlin, which was called the Siedlung, which means settlement. And it was composed of a new building typology, new housing typology, which is the Zeilenbau, which is the parallel uh, roadblock 
and not roadblock, but roadblock. Um, and uh, that these buildings with the standardized dwelling units, and you can see that here, some of the plans for those, which was part of the, the uh, sort of rationalization of the dwelling plan. So he also experimented with uh, prefabrication systems um, using precast concrete panels uh, produced on site. So there was a panel factory on building sites and they could turn out a slab in five minutes. There were also factories producing uh, wall and floor units and precast beams, but also doors and windows and hardware and so on, and even appliances. Uh, and all of these buildings were assembled by cranes. So it was a technical solution that was specific in relationship to each project because of the factories on the site. So the result was understood at the time as a perfect synthesis, here you can see the landscape grown up, of nature and technology. And it combined scientific methods of design and production with natural site planning. And most important though, was that it could generate urban fabric that had a particular relationship to the site and to social programs. So it was, it was mass produced or prefabricated housing, but that was specific to site and to social programs. So it was seen as a new form of industry that was associated and tied to industry, industry not only in terms of its uh, production, um, whoops, getting ahead of myself, but also uh, in terms of the fact that these uh, housing uh, settlements were. Um, uh, in the country, outside the city, along with industry. So they moved with industry outside the city. So um, the system also added an important uh, new constraint or parameter uh, in design, and that was the turning radius of the assembly crane, which actually determined urban form and did so very much uh, in the Soviet context. So. It was on the basis of this, and now we're moving into Soviet space, that uh, uh, of this work in Frankfurt that Ernst May and his brigade, the, the May Brigade as they were called, uh, were invited to uh, the Soviet Union to design a new socialist city, a Sotskarod, in Magnitogorsk, um, and to rationalize Soviet uh, the Soviet building industry for, develop, for the development of, of serial mass housing. I love this image because it's, you see my moving from Germany, uh, the map of Germany into the Soviet Union. Anyhow, the my brigade designed a general plan for Magnitogorsk, Magnitogorsk which is up here uh, on the left. And as you can see, there are these massive super blocks with the double, double exposure housing bars uh, oriented east-west. Uh, and there was also extensive uh, institutional infrastructure in the non-bar buildings that you see on the plan. And here you can see one of these uh, super blocks um, and the, the social infrastructure that was provided in these super blocks. So you can see the evolution <clears throat> of the idea coming from <clears throat> Unwin and his ideas about superblock. So, <clears throat> a bit of a call, no more than that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in fact, only a very small amount of uh, housing and, and magnetic ores were completed. Uh, up there on the left, you can see that sort of area. Um, that was the only part that was built that's got a uh, black line around it. Um, and the Ernst May, uh, the brigade left in 1933. Um, and uh, by that time though, Soviet policy regarding urbanization, as you may know, had uh, shifted away from this kind of research-based um, experimentation towards pragmatism ultimately. Uh, that faced up to the industrial underdevelopment of uh, the Soviet state and also um, went for monumentality. And this was uh, uh, under Stalin. So it was both ideological and economic. 
Um, but in 1957, under Khrushchev, uh, Soviet policy shifted to modernist planning uh, ideas of this early experimental period or earlier experimental period. And they were now combined with this massive push to restructure the, uh, the construction industry in the Soviet Union and to do that through prefabrication and standardized housing typologies. Interesting fact here is that that push was to, tied to the Cold War arms race that the rationalization of housing production made it possible to reallocate labor uh, to military purposes. That's a sidebar, but it's something I find interesting. Anyhow, so from the late 50s on, um, the spatial unit of Soviet planning was this micro ran, micro ran, and uh, micro district. And here's an example um, from uh, Moscow of 1960. So the super block itself was this, uh, the, the micro ran was a massively uh, scaled up super block and Zeebum um, settlement with an average population of around 8,000 to 10,000 people. Uh, the system was applied across the Soviet Union and the satellites, and it was uh, an ongoing field uh, of experimentation. Now, um, Khrushchev, of course, had a background in housing um, uh, when he had been um, equivalent of mayor of, uh, of Moscow and various other positions he had. So he, was, he, he understood prefabrication, and he was very much interested in housing. So in 1955, uh, Khrushchev centralized um, the oversight for housing production into a new state committee for civic construction, uh, which was mandated to standardize design and production of housing and introduce these new prefabrication or prefabricated construction methods. So the rationalization of housing design and production was accompanied by a rationalization of the unit of spatial plan of the micro -ran. So it was a rationalization of production um, and design, but also uh, of um, the, the social unit itself. So here's an example whoops, of uh, a micro -ran in Baku. Uh, it was one of the earliest because Baku was um, you know, as an oil producing center, it was privileged uh, in the Soviet space. Uh, and so a lot of experimentation took place there. Things happened there before they happened elsewhere. So in terms of program, and I think you could see it um, on, the, uh, on the left, actually, I'm gonna move along here to another one where you can see it perhaps better. I don't know if you can read any of the text. Um, but the microregion had a more or less standard set of components. So there was housing, uh, there were apartment blocks. Uh, actually, you could see it here uh, that were of different heights. These are the bar buildings uh, on the plan. And the, the social infrastructure is the non-bar buildings uh, in these plans. Um, they were typified, the apartments, they were prefabricated. Uh, and the types were development, de developed actually in central housing uh, in Moscow, and they were disseminated throughout the republics. Uh, there was also extensive green space. Um, and here you can see that. Uh, this is the microway in one, and here you can see some of the green space. Um, there was also public transportation along major roadways, uh, and there were some rail lines as well. And of course, one of the main things was the social infrastructure and uh, translated some of that here. You can see it in the center of the lower uh, part of that page on the left. So each micro ran was composed of five to eight more or less super blocks that housed about 1,000 to 1,500 people. And the physical size of the micro ran uh, was dictated by access to the various social amenities. So it could be bigger, it could be smaller. Um, so the microarray in itself was equipped with social infrastructure to meet <clears throat> daily and weekly needs of the inhabitants. 
<clears throat> those in, in, included schools and shops and clinics and sports facilities, libraries, and so on. And less frequent uh, needs were met by the larger uh, urban rayon, which we'll look at in a minute. So the rayon, uh, which constituted what was called the uh, residential complex, was composed, and you see one here in plan, uh, of a cluster of four to five micro rayons. And each one, as I said, with this population of around eight, uh, eight to 12,000. Um, another important metric actually was um, the, uh, a set of spatial relationships um, that the micro rants had to be located within 10 minute walk, uh, 10 minute walking distance or public transportation to places of work. And here you can see that these are some of the diagrams that we did for the Baku book. Um, there's the old center of Baku, which is uh, in this map uh, is here and it's the, the uh, sort of stripe bit up there. This is the old Muslim center um, of, uh, of Baku. But so here you can see, and these are the micro rands around it. And this is where industry was in the dotted line. So those are the places of work, and that's a cluster uh, of microrands. Now, um, the structure of the microrands was set by three parameters. The first was the spatial requirements of the social infrastructure, as I said. The second were these insulation norms, actually. And here's a chart of that, um, which were based on the hours of insulation uh, in different zones throughout the, um, the Soviet realm. So, you know, the central zone was about two and a half hours of sunlight a day that was considered sufficient to kill bacteria. Uh, and if buildings were more than nine stories, uh, an extra half hour. So these were calculated according to geographies. And the third parameter was uh, the economics of the assembly crane and that the crane had to be positioned so that as many buildings as possible could be operated by a single uh, crane, could be built by a single crane. So together, these parameters um, uh, determined the scale and organization of the Soviet urban space, more or less, from the 1850s to into the, uh, sorry, 1950s into the 1980s. Uh, and it determined the settlement densities, it determined the landscapes and everyday practices as a result. Um, and so I wanna just give you a side note on this, an interesting uh, phenomenon or anomaly, which is that the earliest micro district, uh, micro ran in Baku, which was begun in 1947, is called oily rocks or neftashlari. Um, it was the boldest experiment, actually. It was the first socialist microran built uh, in Soviet space. It was the only one that was built on water. Uh, it was in fact built on trestles in the Caspian Sea. Um, this was the beginning of offshore uh, drilling in Baku, which was a result of the fact that Hitler had his eye on taking Baku, and as a result, Stalin filled the, the, off, the onshore wells with, with cement, and so they, they didn't work anymore. So um, drilling went out into uh, the, the sea, and it housed thousands of oil workers. So you're only seeing part of it here, both men and women, in uh, apartment blocks that you can't see here because it grew gradually. Um, some of them that were five, seven stories high, and they were linked to, you could see some of the amenities here, they were linked to schools and libraries and shops, there was a bakery, clinics, vegetable gardens, and so on, all on these uh, platforms in the middle of the sea. There were 2,000 uh, rigs and pipelines and about 300 or more, 330 uh, kilometers of road, uh, roadways and platforms, and here you can see more recent image um, of part of uh, oily rocks. So it's a really interesting, I mean, talk about experimentation. This was, and again, it was in Baku. 
experimenting with within some of these parameters that could be considered these this sort of rationalization of production and organization of housing. Now, just a, a sort of postscript here. Um, Towards the end of Soviet, the Soviet period uh, and state socialism in Europe and in Eurasia, much of the social infrastructure uh, and landscape were not built for economic reasons. And microrand planning was dubbed at that time crane urbanism because that was the radius uh, that, that determined the shape of the spaces on their own. And here's an interesting phenomenon. Andres and I were just talking about this. Um, in East Berlin in the 1950s, <clears throat> microrands were built in the bombed out center, uh, inner areas of the city in the eastern part. And since the end of state socialism uh, in Berlin and the unification of Berlin and Germany, they have been privatized. So here in the upper left, you can see the actual uh, sort of microrand inserted into the city. You could see uh, into the fabric of the city, and you can see sort of buildings there, and they're now being gentrified, and they're being densified, and you can see here's a plan on the left, and you can see also where some of this housing uh, and additional buildings are being inserted into uh, the super blocks, um, and so there's a, a kind of merging of um, uh, post-socialist, socialist and post-socialist urban fabric. So go way over, but um, anyhow, that's it. And um, I look forward to, oh, so Andres, we're going to have a little discussion. Yes, Is that right? first of all. Well. So we're gonna open it up in a minute. Um, but I can't help but um, chime in a little bit as somebody who grew up in a microrayon um, and has kind of lived this experience. Um, uh, this was in, in just as a kind of side note in uh, uh, Soviet occupied Estonia, which was one of the member states and got all of the sort of exportations of planning ideas and most of the post-war construction was just like Baku um, or, or many parts of the rest of the union. Um, what I find fascinating with the sort of thread of thought from uh, Raymond Unwin uh, through the Garden City to uh, Ernst May to the Soviet Union, et cetera, is that uh, many of the socialist ideas of an alternative kind of urban space um, got actually experimented both in the East and the West. Uh, so Garden Cities also found a footing in England. They found a footing in the United States and some forms of them in Germany and other parts of Europe. And um, many of those that have been built out in the sort of Eastern Bloc uh, have been criticized for certain um, quality issues, the housing quality, as you mentioned, the kind of uh, oversight of the other things beyond housing, like the amenities or the public spaces, or sometimes even transportation solutions at the sort of expense because the resources were directed to other things like military and, and, and industrial uh, purposes. And um, they have arguably been more successful in some ways in Western contexts. So if you look at the socialist um, towns or new towns in England, or, or even outside of New Jersey or, or, or New York, um, the housing quality and amenity quality is better uh, in, in many ways. But what is fundamentally lost when they are uh, built out in, in a capitalist environment? What are the things that absolutely require that regime or the institutional structure um, of state socialism to, 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 to real, what, what makes it really uncapitalist? So what is not possible in this capitalist world to do? Uh, and what were they able to achieve in your view uh, with the micro in the Soviet space? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> um, fundamentally it's the, uh, what lies at the base of uh, socialist urbanization um, and um, socialist, you know, ideas about or property relations, which is that uh, the space of the city, there's no private space in the city as such. Um, it belongs to the state 
And therefore, and one of the things that I find totally fascinating when looking at a uh, socialist space, and one of the reasons that I got interested in it and started doing um, research, site-based research, is that when there is no division between public and private, actually there are a few things that happen. Um, first of all, you find, you could see it in Berlin, actually another instance where um, you have the fabric of Berlin, uh, the capitalist fabric, and then you have the socialist fabric and buildings are just all over the place. And that what that means also, and that I found really interesting is that you can actually plan with architecture. You don't actually need a plan <laughs> that you can shape urban space with buildings. And so it also means that, and you, you see this in East Berlin, there's a part, it's very clear actually in the, um, the Stalin Allee, which is now the Karl Marx Allee, which there's a first part that's monumental, like Gorski, um, you know, Gorski Prospect. Uh, but then there's a later part um, built under uh, Khrushchev where the buildings are all over the place. And that boulevard itself, that avenue is completely porous and as are the blocks. And so anyhow, that's a fundamental thing. Um, and, you know, Unwin was trying to do that, but it was very constrained. He was still not able to do it in the city, actually. Uh, he did it in one place in Hampstead Garden suburb because the, the person who was funding the whole thing got a, um, a variance, more or mm -hmm. less, to be able to do that. I think it, in that light, it's also fascinating um, to ponder about, um, besides the urban design practice, on the research side, we've been discussing in this series this idea of urban science quite a lot in the in the semester, and I think it highlights your 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 talk very well highlights that um, even what is studied in urban science is strongly influenced by the regime under which it is produced, yeah. and the sorts of things that urban science does in the U.S. context are fundamentally different from this sort of um, hand of the state and and the sort of applying a scientific principle to laying out an entire yeah. settlement. Since sim simply these powers do not exist, and therefore the research is also not necessarily addressing uh, this. So that's that's a I think a fascinating rem reminder for us um, that we we too are influenced by all of all of these contexts. I wanted to ask you actually as a second thing um, uh, something about the contemporary nature of these ideas. The superblock um, has you know famously come back. Um, in, in uh, the super quadras of Barcelona or many other cities trying to replicate now the super block where the cars are pushed to the periphery and the inside becomes sort of this uh, fluid shared zone. Um, things like the micro rayon, which maybe is in one incarnation of the 15 minute city where you're supposed to have you, everything you need, the, the school, the kindergarten and the house market and everything within that short walk. Uh, or, or even these, um, non-auto streets that some cities are now pushing for, including Barcelona, that's moving away from the super block to these sort of um, landscaped avenues where the car is just lifted off. And, and it's just an urban boulevard where, where cars used to roam and many other cities have adopted some forms of that. What are your thoughts on in terms of the influence of Unwin or, the, or others uh, who've kind of really elaborated these ideas and now get like a modern spin in many, many um, incarnations today? Interesting. I think in the Western context, probably uh, the neighborhood unit is more of an operative model. Neighborhood unit, of course, is um, extremely problematic and it's a similar kind of organization of relationships. Mm -hmm. And, but of course it was for very clearly for, you know, single family, I mean, a, you know, standard nuclear family, there were certain relationships with institutions that actually um, uh, uh, did not, I mean, they, they, they did, they excluded certain groups very clearly because they were also car based like Radburn. There were a number of these things yeah. built in the twenties and in the thirties. And uh, so I think that 
the same is probably true, you know, if one looks closely at many of these uh, sort of Western or uh, these kinds of developments in, in the past um, structure. And I think that that's almost, you know, unavoidable. Yeah. Uh, and the system just doesn't allow for that. Right. So long as land is commodified, uh, there's always pressures to develop it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, op let's open it up um, for any Q&A uh, that folks have in the room, or we can also ultimately take some from the online. Yeah. There's a mic going around, so please do use the mic so that the online audience can also hear us. Uh, one at the back and then here. Uh, thank thanks for your talk. Um, I'm curious what dictated kind of the height of the buildings, um, whether they could have been built higher, whether fire safety was a consideration or whether it was something again about the cranes and also on the cranes point, how much did the, the cranes dictate the design of the building versus the needs of the buildings and of housing dictated the design of the cranes? I mean, why couldn't, um, I guess, yeah. How did, how did you kind of suss out what determined what? Uh -huh. Yeah, um, in terms of height, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was a combination of things that it was the structural system uh, more so than the crane. Elevator right? economy. Elevator, yes, exactly. No elevator yeah. economy. Yeah, exactly. And the crane really influenced the layout, the site plan. And that that that's where the you know the economy was of the crane, so that it was you know what you can do around it, and um, and so these things were planned you know centrally, but often and one of the really interesting things when you start to do research site research, is that you discover that um, there was a great deal of informality that happened, and these plans came down from on high. Uh, and from central planning, but uh, they were often kind of modified on the ground. And that's part of the, the kind of experimentation that was going on. On that note, as a side anecdote, in Tallinn, the city I'm from, there's an entire district in the city center that is built because the panel factory was churning out too many panels for other districts. They went overboard with the supply, so they had to do something with them. And so they just put a new district down because there was an exodus. There was an oversupply of panels, uh, as simple as that. There's another question over here. Just on, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I know the, the East German experience with the, uh, with the issue of height and it was, yeah, the people were, could walk up five stories. Right. And so, that was one height of economy, and then the next one was the structural issue of how far how far up they could go with the panels, which was something like eleven. So that's that's. It. I wanted to. I'm. I love the way you dealt with the space relationships from on went on, and I wanted to introduce the category of the street here a little bit more, because I think it's very interesting with where you started with on when separation from the buildings from the street, and that was of course at that time the well understood notion of public versus private, public was the street and private was everything else. Um, and then you get to the transition of socialism and you have that public private thing is, is different from street and non-street. And of course, these days we've got this recovery of the street an attempt to, to find something else in the street. And well, I'm sure you could think through this and I don't have a uh, coherent, complete thought here, but except to ask, um, since obviously this recovery of the street is often seen as associated with gentrification, with the redrawing of class lines, um, did we lose something here or was that already lost with the inadequacies of socialist urbanism, the way it was dictated by very strange forces? Um, and by, uh, I can't remember the, the word you used, but the, the recovery of the street um, explain that to me a little bit more. I mean, you're talking about something very specific. Um, I'm talking about the rejection of 
this general design that's based on solar orientation and separating the buildings from the street as opposed to the ideal of once again having an enclosed street block mm -hmm. um, in order to encourage certain kinds of activities of the street that right. are seen as having been lost but but people who you know have, have see the appeal of this would say something being lost when you do that a lot of things possibly oh. well and also uh it's 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 the liveliness, it's the sort of Jane Jacobs of the street right. that, that gets lost, right? And so, uh, yes, that's true. And it's certainly within the city itself where, um, you know, uh, suddenly the, uh, there's this kind of amorphous space, but the space itself, I mean, that's one of the problems is that the space itself, these garden, uh, you know, areas, and you go to Frankfurt and you see how amazing they are actually and they're cared for, but usually they're not cared for because nobody, nobody owns them, right? And one of the interesting things, I also did research on um, the housing of Red Vienna in the 1920s and they maintained the perimeter, but they created, they went inside and created a public space inside. So they turned the block inside out. But they maintained the street, but they also created this uh, sort of common space inside the block. And a lot of social infrastructure was uh, located there and located in the inner sort of lower level, uh, sort of ground level of those spaces, whereas commercial uh, space was allocated on the street. So there were other ways of, I mean, in Vienna, it was particularly because they were working within the city and so on and so forth, but I mean, there were constraints, but turning the block inside out was a really interesting thing. So you maintain the street, but you also create this sort of common space. Right, which, which softens or relativizes the idea that you get from the outside that there is this revolution when you abolish private property, because what Vienna is, is something in between the, the old capitalist system and socialism. Thank you. Just a follow-up question. Hi, uh, thank you again for your talk. Um, I guess my my question is a little bit related, but also, um, so I, I guess the preface is I uh, I did my thesis, undergraduate thesis specifically on this topic and was really interested in looking at this uh, specifically in, a, in about 10 different Russian cities and was doing field work and all specifically on the, on this topic and with on specifically on the like I guess my point is to sort of bring up this idea of the porosity of this specific space um and how I guess this distinction between the street and the not street becomes really intriguing um and how you're thinking of addressing the fact that I I, I guess my I have two points one is specifically how porous these spaces are because they're incredibly traversable in ways that I find in cities that have less influence from the socialist background tend to be more obstacle driven. I mean, we can take Cambridge as one of them where getting from A to B is incredibly difficult as a pedestrian sometimes, even though it can be relatively short, the distances feel longer because we can't exactly do diagonals. And then the second one is on this question of care and what care can look like in a socialist space when we have this question of this binary between public and private and we don't necessarily get ownership. and. And so specifically, what are these sites of care and how can care come up? Because I don't think it's an aesthetic necessarily that we associate with maybe higher income spaces that can have public investment mm -hmm. necessarily. And so what can be the shape of care specifically in these spaces? And I, I personally would argue that it's often these little tiny interventions where you see water bottles turned into bird feeders or reuse, you know, traditions of reuse um, when we know that public investment is often lacking and sort of reframing this question of not necessarily disuse, but use selectively, um, again, in these really sort of porous spaces. So yeah, I guess these are my two comments and um, I'm incredibly excited to see this talk. And so thank you. Well, that's very exciting development. And to, to look at it in that, to really look closely at that scale of, sort of what I guess one would call informal uh, interventions and a, a kind of, uh, you know, implicit ownership of property um, since it belongs to the state or people or whatever. So, yeah. 
Maybe we can take one last question. We're almost out of time here. Aziz, perhaps. Uh, Aziz, uh, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about if we wanted to live in an affordable city that has character, where do we stand in the trade-off between modular, highly optimized subdivisions versus highly organic, highly one-off subdivisions? One has character, the other has manufacturability and cost efficiency. What's the sweet spot in between? Yeah, I guess I I, uh, I think that the you know what what you call character or what one calls character is problematic or needs clarification because character can mean um, a sort of you know the Jane Jacobs environment that as we know um, you know was was uh, the population that lived there gave it that character or maintained that character and they were you know um sort of middle class upper middle class people so i think character is you know whose character right and what character and uh you know there's there's character in everything i think and so that issue is you know a hugely complicated one I'd, I'd say more on the diversity character versus uh -huh. character as a broad term. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's uh, uh, one of the sort of subtopics of this that has been really interesting to, for me to also personally observe, and I'm sure you've um, dealt with this a lot in places like Baku, is the transition from this uh, state planned environment where the there's no private property right. to one that almost over, overnight obtains private property and everything gets privatized. And what happens to the built environment in that process has been extremely interesting. Um, this is an example, even you know, triple-decker types of neighborhoods that Cambridge has many of, right. and many of these cities, uh, especially the older ones in the Soviet states also had them. And um, they had no demarcations of private property because the, the buildings were expropriated and, and basically reallocated to population. So there was no fences right. between buildings. It's as if you have Cambridge and you're welcome to walk through any yard you want. And that's to be taken for granted that you can cut through any. And so that became a huge debate in the 1990s, which is should the fences go up or should we, should we mandate the fences stay down because people are used to that. And I think all sorts of these mini conflicts that property brings into this is super interesting to trace and what happens and how the built environment morphs into something else in the process. So. You know, one of the, the things that certainly was the case in Zagreb, I don't know whether it's more broad than that, mm -hmm. that when people purchased, um, you know, their apartments, basically they owned the space. Mm -hmm. And you didn't own any space mm -hmm. outside the building. And so that's why a lot of these spaces were yeah. neglected also. But so it's, you know, you own your own particular apartment, you know. home, right? Yeah. Um, but you don't own any, any space around it. And so you have all of these people who are, I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, um, condos, right? Yeah. Um, but sort of different too, because you have a lot of jurisdiction over the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? And and sort of how mm -hmm. things are used. But that that's that was part of the problem with privatization. Too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no. yeah. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate your time. And uh, this also concludes our series this semester. Uh, Stay tuned for other things in the spring. Um, and hopefully we'll get to continue talking about these topics. Thank you.